AITA for calling my psycho ex's unrelated child my notter. Buckle up. Fifteen years ago I was twenty-five and was finishing my contract, and my then-girlfriend of three years, Natalie, was acting increasingly strange. I came back from a two-month assignment and was prepared to break up with Natalie. She came by and gave me the good news, she was pregnant. I asked how far along she was, and she said five weeks, so I broke it off with her and told her she needed to do better at math. She refused the breakup and insisted the baby was mine, so I told her the following. One paternity test and two if the child was mine, we could talk about financial support and custody arrangements with lawyers. She refused both and told everyone we both knew that I was a deadbeat for knocking her up and leaving her. I told everyone I was on a two-month, two-month assignment when she conceived, but a few insisted that for the sake of decency, I house her and give her limited support. I consulted a lawyer about this mess, and the lawyer made it very, very clear that any overt support I give could be seen as me taking responsibility. So I told these friends that, and almost dropped it, except for one guy, who again insisted that charity couldn't be used as a legal cudgel like that. I told him if he believed that, he could house her. He agreed to drop it after that. The child was born and not even going to do the whole, she didn't look like me, because most babies are born with squished faces, and all I saw were the pics she sent me with messages like Emma wants to know where daddy is, and shit. She still refused to take any paternity tests. But her constantly showing up with that baby got to the point where I filed an RO. Fun fact, in my state, a permanent RO is not permanent. It is two F seeking years long. The only way to get it longer is if there is a violent crime associated with it. And apparently, bugging someone with a baby that's not theirs is not a violent crime. So, my life for the last 14 years has been me renewing the RO every two years because, once it clears, Natalie shows up again with my not child. I eventually found a nice girl and got married, and now I have a nine year old son, Henry. My wife, Kim, is well aware of Natalie and Emma. When the cycle begins again, I always say the same thing one paternity test, two, once paternity is proven, I will take custody and get financial support set up. Natalie always refuses and says both are insulting. Recently, the cycle started again, and this time, Emma showed up first. She approached my son during a school event, a visit to the zoo, and said, Hi, I'm your big sister, Emma. Henry knows about stranger danger and runs away to a teacher. I had to have a very, very painful talk with the teachers and parents who were at the event about my relationship with Emma and Natalie, and how Emma was never my daughter. I even called her my nodder once or twice in the conversation. After the group disbanded, one of the mothers confronted me and said that while Natalie was in the wrong telling this poor child I was her father, calling her my nodder was mocking the situation. I kind of get where she's coming from, but I can't help this child. And the honest truth is playing light of the two-year cycles is the closest I can get to finding peace in the situation. Edit. To answer the repeated question in my state, the mother has to start the petition for the father to be established and the test to start. There is no instance where a father can start the petition. There was a chance to do this when Emma was born, but the window was exactly one month, and I was much too focused on the RO, not thinking the paternity angle would bite me in the butt. One last time, to everyone saying, just ask for custody, that'll force a DNA test. Literally, can't be done. Been through this enough with a lawyer, and have consulted with other lawyers. There are laws protecting children, and a lot of them exist for good reason. I'll explain it the way my lawyer explained it. Imagine there's a woman who ran from an abusive ex. She finds out after she escapes she's pregnant. She gives birth, never puts the ex on the birth certificate, and never tries to file for support because she wants to get as far away from him as possible. He finds out years later and tries to rope her back in, using the child as leverage. She can just say no, and the state has to let it go. There is, however, a provision that if the father was involved enough to know when the birth was, he could submit his DNA to the state within 31 days of birth as a potential father, but that time has long passed. The law is designed this way on purpose. In the eyes of the family court, I am a random person, and I was never claimed to Emma. 
if you think the state wants all children to be claimed by fathers and will gladly submit any DNA test whenever any potential father shows up, find a random single mom, call the family court, and say you want to claim her child. I am tired of everyone acting like all I needed to do was fill out one sheet of paper, and this nightmare would end. Please, just call a lawyer for a free consultation or post on legal advice and ask them. It doesn't work that way. Update. Got off the phone with my attorney. We have a preliminary hearing on the new RO this week. We will most likely be issued a temporary RO, and then after that, another hearing for the permanent RO. CPS is investigating Natalie and Emma's living situation. The teacher's report held a LOT of weight, and my lawyer thinks that this might actually be a way to end the madness now. In family court, for minors there exists something that's like a temporary, court-appointed guardian I think the term is guardian ad litem, who is only a guardian for legal purposes and procedures and decisions of such, including for medical. If the family court appoints such for Emma, we can ask this temporary guardian for the DNA test and get this put to the ground. The madness might actually have an ending in sight. Adding here. I feel like I need to explain the relationship I had with Natalie all those years ago. When I got back from my two-month assignment, I was already dead set on breaking up with her. Her, oh wait, I'm pregnant, was never going to make me marry her. In fact, I doubted she was pregnant for several weeks. In the last year of our relationship, several red flags appeared in her behavior, ranging from demanding I check in with her while at work, only hanging out with friends with her present, and extreme bouts of jealousy if I ever seemed too friendly with women, including waitresses. I was in a line of work that demanded me to be away for long stints, which she hated, but also kept me out of her reach for long periods of time. I think it was halfway through that last year I realized that when I was away, I did not miss her. In fact, I was relieved to plop into a cot and fall asleep after long hours of work without thinking about her. When the pregnancy turned out to be real, I made it clear that with a paternity test, I would pay support, split custody, and be a co-parent and nothing more. She wanted me to be her husband, no questions asked. No test, just pure blind faith and devotion to her and the child. The test, she insisted, was insulting. There was never going to be a relationship, and there was no relationship to salvage with Natalie. On the advice of the first attorney I hired, the deal was no test, no contact. Court Update The preliminary hearing on the new RO went well. Emma and Natalie were there, and we discovered that Emma is currently living with her great-grandmother and has a guardian ad litem court appointed guardian on legal matters. My lawyer thinks this means whatever was found in Natalie's home situation warranted removing Emma and potentially severe enough that the great-grandmother only has physical custody and the need to appoint a guardian ad litem. During the hearing, we went through the whole song and dance, the past ROS, the whole deal. My lawyer turned to Emma's representative and said we were willing to submit to a DNA test and put this to bed. Natalie looked like she was having a conniption at that, and her own lawyer urged her to shush. Emma's representative accepted, and we were cheek swabbed in the courthouse. A temporary order is now in place, and a second hearing is scheduled for the permanent two-year order in the upcoming weeks. The order covers immediate family on both sides and as I've detailed in the past, Natalie is actually good with following court orders. We have about four weeks before we have the definitive test results back, but I'm not too worried either way. P.S. There were some people who thought the court couldn't use charity as a cudgel was the father. Well, that's Jim. Haven't talked to Jim in 10 years, but Jim is gay and hates Natalie. He just also happened to be a give-the-shirt-off-his-back kind of dude, and as long as I knew him, he volunteered at a food pantry. His protests came mostly from naivety, not self-interest. Paternity Update We got the results in late last week, as did Emma's party. I am not the father. Natalie had a major blow-up when she heard the news from her grandmother Sylvia Emma's currently living at Sylvia's and is out of Natalie's custody. This blow-up included a major tantrum on my front lawn, which also violated the temporary RO. Natalie has been arrested, but Sylvia hasn't bailed her out. 
Sylvia has communicated to my lawyer that she wants to apologize for bankrolling Natalie's life for the past 15 years. I only met Sylvia a few times when I was dating Natalie, and I know Natalie grew up with her and Sylvia, had money, but I was never really told the extent of that. Sylvia has communicated, via my lawyer, which is technically allowed with the RO in place, that both she and Emma want to send me an apology, via a letter. I told my lawyer they were free to write whatever letters they wanted as long as this was the last communication we had with them. The permanent RO is certainly going to be granted now, with the emergency one violated. We still don't know what caused Emma to be removed from Natalie's care, or if Natalie has any underlying issues. If we do get the letters, I will post them. Imagine overhearing your own father wish for a different son, just because you're not into his favorite hobby. That's what happened to me. My dad, 45M and grandpa have always been car enthusiasts, and they share a special bond over their love for fixing and talking about cars. I, 17M on the other hand, have never been into cars. I know the basics, but I don't share their passion. Recently, our new neighbors moved in next door, and their nephew Mason 16M, who is obsessed with cars, started spending time with my dad in the garage. I didn't mind because my dad and I have other things we do together. But on Father's Day, while waiting to ask my dad something, I overheard him tell Mason, you're exactly the kind of son I wanted to have. Those words cut deep. I never thought my dad had an issue with me not being into cars, and hearing that made me feel like a disappointment. Since then, I've been ignoring my dad, and my sister 19F joined in after I confided in her. My parents noticed the tension, and despite their questions, I kept quiet about the reason. The situation escalated during a family meeting where my dad initially denied saying it, then claimed I misunderstood him. My mom got involved, and now she's banned our neighbors from visiting. My dad left the house, and I'm left feeling guilty for not letting this go. Am I the asshole for not forgiving my dad? My dad, 45M, is really into cars. His dad, my grandpa, is also into cars. My grandpa used to work in a mechanic shop, and my dad taught him how to work on cars. They can talk for hours about different car models and engines and tell stories about cars they've worked on. I, 17M, am not really into them. My dad tried to get me into fixing cars with him, but it didn't work. I know basic stuff like how to change a tire or oil and jumpstart a battery because he taught me, and I'm glad about it. But talking about cars and working on them for fun, I'm just not into it. I always thought my dad was okay with me not being a car guy. Five months ago, we got these new neighbors who had moved next door. They are married, and their nephew Mason 16M lives with them. Mason and I go to school together. At first I helped show him around school until he got comfortable and made his friends. He and I still talk, but we don't hang out. Mason is like my dad and grandpa. He's obsessed with talking about cars and has a list of cars he wants to drive and own one day. He would come over with his aunt and uncle, and many times Mason and his uncle would hang out with my dad in the garage. Sometimes I'd be there too, but usually it's just them. My dad usually works on his project car in the garage every other weekend for several hours. For Father's Day this year, he said he wanted to work on his car all day uninterrupted, which my mom agreed to. Whenever he works on his car, he leaves the garage door open. Mason has been coming by when my dad works on it for the past couple of months, and he talks to my dad and sometimes helps him out with smaller stuff related to the car. I don't care. My dad does other stuff with me. But on Sunday, I went to ask him something when he was in the garage with Mason. The door from the house to the garage was open, and he and Mason were talking. I was waiting by the door for a chance to speak because I didn't want to interrupt their conversation. My dad was praising Mason for whatever he did. Mason said he had done that with his dad, and my dad told Mason that his dad would be proud of him. Then he said Mason was the kind of son that he wanted to have. I why, but that fucking hurts to hear. I never thought my not being into cars was an issue for my dad. I knew he still loved me, but that's not enough. I didn't say anything and just went back to my room. He doesn't know that I know what he said. I've been ignoring him since then. I still answer him when he asks me questions or tells me to do something, but I don't want to talk to him anymore. He and my mom, a 43F, have asked me if something is wrong, but I lie and say no. 
I thought they would just let it go. Still, a few days ago, I messed up and told my older sister 19F what happened because she kept asking, and now she's not talking to my dad either, and she's a lot meaner to him about it. But I made her promise not to tell anyone the reason, so she's keeping her word. It's tense in our house right now. My parents kept asking us why we were mad at our dad, but neither of us answered. I don't know, maybe I should just let it go and return to how things were. I don't want to though when my dad is disappointed in who I am. Am I the asshole if I don't forgive my dad? My dad asked to be left alone to work on his car, but it's not because he didn't want to spend Father's Day with us. We had a special breakfast for him and gave him his gifts in the morning. The incident happened in the late afternoon. My mom usually wants to be left alone to work on her art projects or read one of her books on Mother's Day. It's not that they don't want to spend the day with us. They just like to focus on their hobbies without worrying about household or family duties for a few hours. It's normal in my family for my mom and dad to sometimes give each other breaks or a day off. Another thing is my dad didn't invite Mason to work on the car with him. He told Mason a while back that if the garage door is open, Mason can walk in and chat. That's what Mason usually does. My dad doesn't talk to him outside of when Mason comes over alone or with his aunt and uncle. I don't think my dad even has Mason's number. They're not close. They're both just like cars. I know most people told me to tell my mom, dad, or both about what I heard. I was kind of hoping the tension would go away and just be forgotten, which I know is dumb and not realistic. Still, I didn't want that awkward conversation so I kept quiet. Things got really bad today. My sister and I were still mostly ignoring our dad. My mom would keep asking us questions and guessing why we were mad. I thought she gave up but earlier today, she said we would have a family game night tonight, which we never really do. I didn't feel like doing that but I would sit there and just deal with it. But my sister told my mom we wouldn't join if dad was there. My mom asked why, but my sister said he knew what he had done. So my mom went to talk to our dad, and about an hour later, she made us all sit down in the living room to talk. My dad was mad now. He told us that we need to say whatever is on our minds, because now our mom is asking if we caught him cheating on her or something. She was running out of theories for why we were mad. TBF she guessed it right on the second day, asking if he had said something to make me mad or upset, but I lied and said no at the time. She said she knew it had something to do with me because I was mad at him first. So I finally told her what I overheard my dad say. My mom was shocked and my dad immediately denied it, which sucked. Cause if he thought it and said it out loud, he could at least have the balls to admit it, but he didn't. He said he didn't say that, but I told him I knew what I heard. He tried to lie and say that what he said was that Mason's dad would be proud of him, that's true, and that if Mason was his son, he'd be proud of the kind of person he was. That's a lie. He didn't say that. My sister got mad and told him to stop gaslighting me. Then they argued for a couple of minutes until my mom stopped them. My mom asked me if I knew what I heard, and I said yes. I told her what he said to Mason, your dad would be proud of you, I know I would be, you're exactly the kind of son I wanted to have. I know that because I keep hearing my dad's voice saying it over and over in my head. I've been hearing it whenever I look at him since that day. And my mom turned to my dad and started yelling at him for saying that. So my dad finally admitted it but said that I misunderstood him. He says he was just trying to make Mason feel better cause Mason was sad and kept talking about his dad, who died because it was Father's Day. My dad wasn't trying to put me down or say I was a disappointment to him. He said he was sorry and tried to hug me, but I was mad that he denied it initially, so I didn't let him. My mom didn't accept his reasoning either. She said that Mason, his aunt and uncle aren't invited anymore and that we're just gonna be neighbors from now on, and that's it. I feel bad cause they didn't do anything wrong. But my mom kept going and telling my dad that he needed to stop spending so much time on his stupid car and start paying more attention to his family. He doesn't spend a lot of time on it. Maybe like two days out of the month for three to four hours. I think she was just really mad at him, which is what I was worried about. So my dad shouted that he'd just get rid of the car since everyone suddenly had a problem with his hobby. After that he left for my uncle's house, his brother, and I don't think he's coming back tonight.
I feel really bad. I should have just let it go. I want to, but I can't. If he hadn't tried to lie and just said sorry, maybe I would have accepted his apology, and this would have been done. I'm not even mad anymore. I just feel like a failure. I wish I could have just been more into cars. Then this whole thing would have never happened. It's not a happy update, but many people asked for one. I hope he comes back home soon.